This is a revision video about the A-level chemistry topic of Born Harbour Cycles, which comes up at the start of the thermodynamics topic in AQA A-level chemistry. In Year 12 you studied the energetics topic and you learnt that Hess's law tells us that the enthalpy change or heat energy change at constant pressure for a reaction is independent of the route taken. And so this means that we can draw Hess's cycles to allow us to make predictions about enthalpies that are difficult to measure directly. The born harbour cycle is a really specific version of a Hess's cycle and it's applied to an ionic solid. It allows us to calculate the lattice enthalpy of formation by using ionisation energy, electron affinity, enthalpy of atomization, enthalpy of formation, as in the original one that you learnt in year 12, not lattice formation, and sometimes also using either bond enthalpy data or enthalpies of solution and hydration. If you're not already familiar with what all those definitions are, then I would backtrack and watch the definition video before you watch this one. Like many things in A-level chemistry, if you're lacking the context for this, then you might be left thinking, well, what's the point? But this isn't just a theoretical exercise. Using born harbour cycles allows us to predict the enthalpies of formation for theoretical compounds, things that don't even exist yet, and it allows us to predict whether these compounds will be stable and actually likely to exist in the real world. So this allows us to actually decide, before we spend a lot of money on reactants, whether something is worth doing. One really cool example of this is the first example of a compound involving one of the noble gases. Until the 1960s we thought that these didn't form compounds at all, but then Neil Bartlett was able to show that he could use platinum fluoride gas to oxidise oxygen molecules, and since the first ionisation energy of xenon was actually less positive than the one of oxygen, it should be theoretically possible to do the same thing. And he was able to do this and able to make xenon hexafluoroplatinate. Before we get into the whys and wherefores of how you can draw these cycles, let's just talk a little bit about the numbers that we're expecting to get out, because these are often tied up in the same kind of question. The first rule you should know is that the larger an ion is, the less negative the lattice formation enthalpy is likely to be. And just to point it out, that is the language we need to be using. We need to be talking about these being more or less negative or more or less exothermic. Don't say bigger or smaller because you just won't get the mark. So if we think about a fluoride ion and an iodide ion, they both have a single negative charge. But the iodide ion is larger, it has more shells, and so that same charge is spread over a larger area. And therefore its attraction to positive ions like a lithium ion is weaker. And so therefore the lattice formation enthalpy of lithium iodide is a less negative number than the lattice formation enthalpy for lithium fluoride. The other trend you need to be aware of is that the higher the charge on the ions, the stronger the attraction between them will be, and therefore the more negative or more exothermic the lattice formation enthalpy will be. We're now going to look at a couple of different examples for how we can draw these born harbour cycles. For AQA A-level chemistry, they do tend to give you a partially complete cycle and just ask you to fill in the gaps, but it's well worth you spending the time to learn how to draw these from first principles, because it will help you to understand better what's going on. We're always going to start with our elements in their standard states, but these aren't going at the very bottom of the page, they're going raised slightly up. From here, any exothermic processes with negative enthalpies are going to go down, and any endothermic processes with positive enthalpies are going to be represented by arrows pointing up. The first enthalpy that I'm going to add to my diagram is the standard enthalpy of formation of the ionic compound that I'm trying to form. So in this instance, sodium chloride, and I can label this as delta HF. Because this is an exothermic process, the arrow is pointing down. Now going in the other direction, I've got two options. I need to turn both the sodium and the chlorine into gaseous atoms, but it doesn't actually matter which order I do these in. However, I tend to always do the metal first, so that's what we'll do here. So I've got the standard enthalpy of atomization for sodium as I turn one mole of sodium atoms that are solid into one mole of gaseous atoms. Now I need to do the same thing for the chlorine. And here's the first point where people often make mistakes, because they look at the fact that we have half a mole of chlorine molecules and think, well, maybe I need to half the value of the delta H atomization. But what you need to remember is that the standard enthalpy of atomization is the value for forming one mole of gaseous atoms. So even though we only have half a mole of molecules, that doesn't matter because we are making one mole of atoms. And so we need to use the full value for delta H atomization. Next, we need to think about electrons being lost and gained to form ions. So again, I'm going to go metal first, and we're going to start with the first ionisation enthalpy of sodium. 
Remember when you write the equation at this stage to include that electron. Quite often I see people turning atoms into ions and the electron has just disappeared somewhere and we're going to need it, so make sure you include that in your equation. Once we have a sodium ion and an electron, that electron can be given to the chlorine atom and so we need the first electron affinity. This is an exothermic process and so this arrow is always going to point down. Now we have a mole of gaseous ions of sodium and a mole of gaseous chloride ions and so these can form together to form a mole of our solid ionic compound and this is the enthalpy of lattice formation. The next step will be using the data that are given to me in the exam question to assign each one of these arrows a number. For this question that's quite straightforward because there aren't any weird tricks, there aren't any halves or anything, we just need to make sure we get the right enthalpy in the right place. So we have enthalpies of formation, atomization for sodium, atomization for chlorine, ionization enthalpy for sodium, electron affinity for chlorine, and then we're trying to work out this final green value, this lattice formation. If you've seen my Hesse cycle videos, then you know that I always like to write start and end at either end of the arrow I'm trying to find the value of. Because when I do this, it's going to make sure that I actually follow the cycle the right way round and don't give away two thirds of the marks because I've got the wrong sign on my answer. So I'm going from start to end. And to do that, I need to go the wrong way up this electron affinity arrow, the wrong way along these three arrows, and the right way along this formation arrow. So I'm going to take the negative of minus 349, the negative of plus 496, the negative of plus 122, the negative of plus 108, and then my final value I just add on as it is, I don't need to reverse it because I'm going the right way down that arrow, and that gives me an answer of minus 788 kilojoules per mole. Once you know how to draw these Born Harbour cycles, there isn't a huge amount of variation in the questions, but there are a couple of little things that could trip you up. So let's just look at those now. If we think about magnesium chloride, of course we're going to need two chloride ions for every one magnesium ion. So when it comes to the enthalpy of atomization of chlorine, I'm going to need two sets of that value because I'm going to need to make two moles of chlorine atoms. Also, because magnesium is in group two, it makes ions with a two plus charge. So I'm going to need values for both the first ionization and the second ionization of magnesium. And the second value is going to be larger because I'm trying to remove the electron from an ion that's already got a positive charge. Also, thinking back to my chloride ions, because there are two of them, I am going to need two, um, two types of the electron affinity for chlorine. So again, before I complete my calculation, I'm going to write start, end, and draw myself a nice big arrow to make sure I go the right way around this cycle. And if I add up all the different parts of that cycle, then I'm left with a formation value of minus 2,524 kilojoules per mole. And if I think about it, it does make sense that that is a larger number because we've got the bigger charge on the magnesium ion. To finish off, let's look at magnesium oxide. Now there are two things that are slightly different in this question. The first one is that rather than give us the enthalpy of atomization, which we've used in the past, they've given us the bond dissociation enthalpy for oxygen. And although the arrow is going to be the same, that means that we have to treat the number we've been given slightly differently. The second thing is that of course oxygen is in group six, so it makes ions with a two minus charge, and therefore we have a second electron affinity for oxygen. And the thing you want to spot here is that while the first electron affinity is exothermic, the second one is always endothermic, because of course we're now trying to add a negative electron to a negative ion. And so our cycle here is going to look slightly more complicated. So as we come to fill in this cycle, we need to be aware that firstly, it's going to be a slightly funky shape because of the whole second electron affinity. But also when it comes to this arrow, we're actually using half of the bond dissociation enthalpy because a bond dissociation enthalpy is for breaking a whole mole of bonds. And so it will make two moles of atoms. And that's not what we've got. We've only got one mole of atoms. So this same arrow could be represented by the whole enthalpy of atomization or by half of the bond association enthalpy. So you need to be aware of which value they've given you in the question. Then everything else is pretty much the same. But as you can see, our second electron affinity, we have an upwards arrow to show that it's an endothermic process. So if we add some values to that, again, we can write start, we can write end, we do the arrow around, 
and then every arrow we're going the right way down we just use as it is and every arrow we're going the wrong way down we're going to take the negative of. So all that together gives me a final value of minus 3,888 kilojoules per mole. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you found that a useful introduction to Born Harbour Cycles. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-Level Chemistry videos coming soon.